form of property and property rights. You have a right to your property. So it's a concept where slavery is probably in the, especially in the European, the uh, British colonies, slavery was basically reduced to one racial group. Usually the model for slavery in Greek and Roman times is slaves who are captives of war. Slaves could be of any race. In fact, the word Slav, sl comes, slave, came from the word Slav, a particular group that was enslaved by the Romans. So three conditions in that, as I was talking about the other day, master, slave, and maroon. So masters are, edu once they have a sy sy an economic system that depends on free or reduced labor to maintain their control, they have to find a ready population to enslave and also maintain a slave population through a form of indoctrination or uh, miseducation. Maroons, well, we'll discuss that. A maroon is a person who could have been a slave, but also could be free. And the reason I chose, for example, Sankofa as a, uh, as a film is it basically talks about that there were maroon societies outside of slavery, and they came from a different, um, a different orientation. So if you're going to kind of do a contemporary uh, interpretation of Maroon, think of uh, the Matrix movies and Zion. Zion is a Maroon society operating on the edges of the machine society, trying to free people within, from within the Matrix. So, fun with the dictionary. My favorite dictionary is the American Heritage Dictionary, just because even if that's just a marketing term, the American heritage, people don't necessarily interrogate the traditional canon. So all my definitions for like Western civilization, etc., Christianity, have come from the American Heritage Dictionary. Now one of the things that you find when you study dictionaries, and the reason I like this one, and this is the standard I would promote for you, is you need to find out where the words came from in their original language. And American Heritage gives you that. So, savage, and the adjective. Not domesticated or cultivated, a primitive or uncivilized person. Not civilized, barbaric, ferocious, fierce, vicious or merciless, brutal, lacking in polish or manners, rude. From Middle English, sauvage, okay, or Old French, Latin, sylvaticus, of the woods, wild, i.e. silva, forest. So this is, you know, originally from the Latin, silva, of the forest, to savage, to savage. So person who doesn't live in a city, but lives out in the wild somewhere. Another English equivalent, applied originally from English Christians to the Irish and Scots people, heathen, because they lived out in the Heather, out in the sticks. What do we say about hicks? They live out in the sticks, not in the city, right? That's a, a convention of language in English. That's where this dates back to. Savages. Sauvage. Civilization, right? A society that has a high level of culture and social organization, an advanced degree of development in society that is marked by complex social and political organization and material, scientific, and artistic progress. All the societies have an advanced level of development collect considered collectively, places where people live rather than uninhabited areas, the level of material comfort that someone is used to, the process of creating a high level of culture in a particular society or region. This from my Microsoft Word Macintosh onboard dictionary, basically same as American Heritage. 
So mastery, when we're talking in an African context, from the African, African experience, in chiefly societies in Africa before the rise of Kemet, Egypt, the age grade system of education gave an individual the skills for self-mastery. So mastery is self-mastery. Self-knowledge, self-control, thus self-worth, self-sufficiency. Once you had those things, you were responsible for those younger and responsible to those older. And you demonstrated that mastery by your daily conduct and human relations in the village or community. You demonstrated that in courageous acts during wartime, because anybody could be a warrior or follow a warrior. You could also become a leader by demonstrating an ability to unify people and serve their needs before your own, and this was considered royal worth. So those kind of qualities made you a master, not fear and domination. Self-control. And in this context then, a slave was a person who could not control themselves or chose not to. They did not heed the teachings of their elders or community. They acted selfishly without honor or a sense of justice. Their physical animal nature ruled them, rather than their divine spiritual nature ruling their animal impulses. So, for example, if a conflict between nations led to war, people abandoned or otherwise captured became slaves. Because during the, the African form of warfare, uh, you were, it, the idea was not to totally slaughter uh, your opponent, but to reduce them to a state where they either ran away, and, but you were also allowing them to withdraw from the field of battle and take their wounded with them. Anybody that was left, uh, therefore abandoned, became a slave. So a slave, under the fundamental rights of African people, had the right to earn their freedom through education and demonstrated mastery the same as any other person. Now before European contact, you had slaves, but they weren't permanent. Your biblical references for this are, for example, the example of Joseph, who got sold into slavery by his brothers, but then became advisor to Pharaoh after being in that condition of slavery. So there was some limited social mobility within that particular context. Now, today... A slave can generally be defined in economic terms as a person who's forced to work exclusively for minimum room or board. So generally you have to be forced into this condition because nobody would do it willingly. You have no choice or they're going to kill you if you don't or whatever. So one of the things I'm trying to, in making these distinctions, what I'm trying to do is say, look, slaves could be any class in the societies they came from. All they had to be was captives of war. They could be kings, they could be doctors, they could be griots, they could be in any, any, not caste, but any role within the societies that they came from. They could be literate. For example, so one third of the slaves being brought to the United States alone were Muslims who were forced to become Christians. So, captives of war. So, they could be any race, historically, but it was only in the European colonies in Turtle Island that chattel, that is, humans as properties, became to be the populated exclusively by one race. So any African in captive war could be enslaved, but it was not a permanent condition in Africa. You could earn your freedom. So not that I'm defending the chiefs, but they thought that this was the case when they were selling people into slavery. Now, this is the classic configuration of a slave ship. What it doesn't show you, so this is like a floor plan on uh, deck floors. So when you, they talk about having essentially 18 inches between people, that's literally, you know, 
you're chained together, you might be able to turn over. But this is basically the configuration on the floor. And then there's another 50 people on racks above the layers that you don't see on each level. So essentially, the 468 I did count. And another 50 on racks above per deck. And this is a brigantine. This is a medium-sized slave ship. There were slave ships that were bigger that could hold 900 people. Now, we're not counting the crew. Crew might be another 50 or 100 people. So the ship has to carry those folks, carry food for them. Was it made specifically for the ships? Yeah, well, remember, these are European warships. So when I say brigantine, basically it's a ship big enough to you know, hold X amount of people, weapons, cargo, because these were armed. Because people are, you know, they're trying to constantly take over the ship, right? So just like, um, you know, like a man of war, you know, they are armed. That's it's not, not in the full floor plan, but, you know, normally they'd be holding cargo, weapons, etc., etc. But in addition to cargo and weapons, they basically got human cargo and, you know, enough to feed them. So there's another movie you could also see, which is also uh, pretty commercial uh, and actually tame compared to Sankofa. It's Steven Spielberg's Amistad. Now, ironically, you know, so let's see, Jaimon Hansu, um, what's the other actor, British actor, played The Silence of the Lambs. James uh, Hopkins, Tony Hopkins, Anthony Hopkins, plays um, John Quincy Adams. So Amistad means a friend, and it was basically a particular um, slave ship uh, that went to Cuba, uh, started on the west coast of Africa, went to Cuba, and uh, essentially what happened with Amistad, just to use it as an example, so depending on where you were, where you were from, so for, and I think I'll show this shortly, but as an example, so the Amistad Rebellion was one of 150 documented, so that's documented, and probably there could have been more, but 150 documented rebellions. And it was an unsuccessful one. So successful, the successful ones go like this. The slaves somehow get out of their chains, take over the ship, and sail themselves back to Africa. Okay, so that's a successful one. So the successful ones are a small fraction of the ones that happen. So Amistad was one of the successful ones. Now, the mark of the successful one is that they killed the crew and sailed themselves back to Africa. Now, Amistad, being, as a, being a portrayal of one of the unsuccessful ones, what it at least shows is that, okay, how are these Africans able to pilot this ship off the coast of Cuba and sail back to Africa? How are they able to do that? Where do they get that wherewithal to do that? I mean, you can't just take over a ship. You know, how are you going to sail it? So what it shows, at least correctly, uh, as far as, and this is a detail that uh, Spielberg got right, even though he claimed that he, you know, he adopted a black kid and never heard of Amistad. Well, in my generation, <laughs> this is one of the things that you know about standard, like Emmett Till. Like, 
the Amistad affair and you know some secret things about slavery and some other things some of which I've imparted to you and some of which stay in house as it were so Amistad was basically an unsuccessful one but it did pr correctly show that people were able to navigate a ship and because they let the crew live at night the Africans were going in the direction of Africa because they could see the stars to navigate and daylight the crew sailed them back so they wound up going in a zigzag up the American coast finally getting captured in Connecticut by an, by an American ship if they killed the crew and just gone back to Africa they would have made it so we'll talk about Amistad a little later so, British colonies, and later the Americans were first places where slaves were restricted to one or two races, Africans, and in some cases, Irish and Scots, the high, highland clearances. And the Irish and Scots were, of course, shipped on ships like this as well. So, another condition. So, with an inborn knowledge of the African rights and constitution and rights system, Africans rebelled, as the, did the Scots and the Irish, against chattel slavery. So, for example, Queen Nzinga started as the general of her brother's armies and later became queen of what's now Angola. Defeating the Portuguese in her early 20s, she ruled until her death at 81. Though some uh, historians will say, well, she may have fought the Portuguese, but she didn't totally, totally defeat them. But she was still able to rule her country, even, um, some say, converting to Christianity. Queen Nzinga was basically um, one of the, that her country, Angola, now known as Angola, was one of the places that uh, women could be military commanders and then also the leaders of their country, leading co-ed or single-sexed armies. And the style of leadership is you lead from you lead the battle from the front. So her country, the martial art known by its Brazilian name capoeira, came from her country. So hundred recorded slave revolts at sea on slave ships, successful ones. Might have been used, capoeira can use because you could use it while in chains. Some of the move, well, when first started, people first started seeing um, capoeira demonstrations, they're saying, oh, well, that looks like breakdancing. No, breakdancing takes its moves from capoeira. So, successful rebellion, okay, you take over the ship and sail yourself back home. You could basically do that, especially from Nzinga's country, or if that martial art particularly spread, you could basically take over a slave ship while in chains. So, Amistad, of course, was unsuccessful because they allowed the crew to live. Never give a slaver an even break. So everywhere in Brazil, and in fact everywhere there was chattel slavery, slaves escaped and formed their own communities. Brazil, the first non-European, non-Indian republic was a quilombo called Palmares, as I've talked about. The Maroons of Palmares maintained a free republic for nearly a century, even after Palmares fell. Active resistance continued for nearly a century after that. And there are still quilombos today and maroon societies today 
So if you've never seen capoeira, it's done to um, music. It is a rhythm. The uh, practice forms, which in karate we call kata, uh, jogas are uh, the practice forms. It's basically a fight and a dance with your opponent. So maroon, a slave can escape slavery. A maroon, and that, where that word came from, a slave can escape slavery if, they know, if all they know is the master's culture, then they cannot be free because they will carry the master's culture with them. A maroon escapes slavery and recreates their original free culture or a free culture uh, based on improvising. So if you remember the twin African influences of tradition and innovation, this is a Spanish woodcut of Columbus making first contact with the Taino nation. Taino, uh, maroon is a Taino word which means wild, untamed, free. So according to the narrative of the Spanish, the Spanish wiped out all the Taino on one island thinking they had wiped them all out except they were all through the Caribbean as well as parts of Mexico. Taino joined with others, including uh, free Africans, and uh, fought back. So others might have included the African slaves under the Spanish who were left when the Spanish uh, abandoned the land of the Springs or Jamaica in 1655. So there are Maroons in the hills of Jamaica today. So the British attempted to re-enslave the Africans by uh, you know, leading a battle and they lost. So this is a uh, painting of a group of Maroons negotiating a peace treaty with the British because the British lost. So they negotiated on their own terms a peace treaty with British planters. They couldn't beat them militarily, couldn't enslave them, couldn't stop their raids, freeing slaves, livestock, and plantings. So basically they cut this deal where the Maroons could hunt undisturbed. They agreed to stop raids and could sue a planter in court without being sued themselves. And with Jamaican independence, because Jamaica remained a colony until the 60s, a separate deal had to be cut with the Maroons in the mountains who have remained, maintained their independence to this day. Now, the problem that they have is dealing with multinationals who are prospecting on their lands for aluminum, for example. How do you attack a multinational? How do you attack Alcoa? If you kill Bill Gates, does that mean a Microsoft stop? Microsoft stops? No. Multinationals are not nation states, but they have the power of national governments. Especially in the United States where they're considered people. This is a 20th century Jamaican maroon chief displaying copy of the treaty with the British. Notice who's at his house. Picture on his desk. Like in Zynga before her, so the Coromanti Maroons <clears throat> practiced and spoke the Akan language and, t and culture. So here's what the British did, and here's how they made their mistake, particularly with Jamaica. They had slaves, right? You saw Willie Lynch's letter. So Willie Lynch was a British slaver, right? And he came to the Virginia plantation with a plan on here's how you control your slaves. So the British had this idea that the Akan people of Ghana, since they are already taking slaves from Ghana, the Akan people of Ghana seem to be fairly well disciplined and militaristic. And they thought, oh, if we take the Akan and enslave the Akan, they will give discipline to the rest of our slaves for us. Really, 
They seriously thought that. Okay, sure, Massa. We'll do that for you. No, is what happened. The Khan also had egalitarian political and military structures. In other words, any place person could attain any position regardless of sex if they displayed the requisite characteristics. So using, so this is Nanny of the Maroons. She's a national hero of Jamaica. She was one such woman who told, basically speaking uh, the Akan language, the Coromante Maroon speaking the, the Akan language, organized military tactics and she was the general. And she also trained her armies by essentially establishing um, a system where the, she could tell them stories, fables, and uh, battle tactics. So, following the footsteps of Nzinga and presaging General Harriet Tubman, Nanny crafted effective battle plans. And she also told stories, gave instructions in African culture. So the idea, of course, since the British are not allowing, um, they're not necessarily educating your slaves in order to get an education, you'd have to leave slavery. So this was uh, an animated GIF that I found on a Jamaican website. I don't have the reference now because it seemed to be closed. So I actually felt good that I was able to get this. When you put your current, I, I was able to do a screen capture of the moment that I put the cursor over what looks like a banana tree. Well, actually, this is a banana tree, and this is a bush next to the banana tree. There's a guy crouched there with a spear, and maybe you can see this closer. There's another one right there, and another one right there. Now, if you've seen the Patriot, the Mel Gibson movie, the lame Mel the Gibson movie, okay? You notice that the British are standing in the line like gentlemen, like shooting at each other. Like, that's how Europeans conducted warfare. We're gentlemen, this is warfare, this is like a duel, except with hundreds of people standing in the line, boom, reload, boom, reload, whoever has the most people standing is won. Okay. Akans, Africans don't fight like that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're gonna do, we're gonna attack a plantation and split into the jungle. And then the British, of course, are gonna be forced, you know, because you pick your ground. This is why they tell you to pick your battles. That is the time and the place and the ground that suits you. It's basic warfare, right? So you go through a jungle, you have to go through single file, and there you are, right? So you're passing what looks like a stand of banana trees, and then all of a sudden, boom, they come alive. And there's a killing zone. So yeah, the British are going to give up, because the Maroons can attack at will, and if you follow them into the hills, you get slaughtered and there's no way of wiping them out once they get up there. And you can't defend yourself. So yeah, they're going to sign a peace treaty. <laughs> the Maroons can hunt where they want, can continue to rustle cattle, and oh, oh well. So Nanny, and it's Nanny who basically developed that ta those battle tactics among other things, because she was the general. So that's why she's on the back of their $500 bill. So we talk about slavery, then we also have to talk about what's going on at the same time and how, um, just like I was talking, when I was introducing the concept of memes, a meme doesn't have to be true, it just has to be successful. So the meme of white supremacy, which at this point is now only 300 years old,
can express in contradicting ways, so kind of a love, hate, and respect and fetishism. So slaves could be bought, freed, and put on a pedestal, but only in rare instances could they remotely be considered equal. So even if they sat on the throne, their race could be used